Hi everybody, my name is Dave Martins and I am the new director at the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition and I'm here with Liz Curry from and the Common Land Solutions. Common Land Solutions. And joining us on the phone is Sarah Teal from uh, Voices for Vermont Children. And so we're here tonight to talk uh, during our, uh, our time slot tonight about housing and how it relates to children and to early childhood development. And just to sort of say a word about how uh, this came about is that at VAHC, we've decided to uh, kind of uh, roll out, I guess you'd call it a program, a new program, where we talk each month about housing um, in light of a particular theme. And so in September, we were talking about um, how housing impacts the recovery community because September is National Recovery Month. And so we decided that for October, we would go with children's health. And the reason for that being because yesterday, the day before yesterday, the day before yesterday was National Ch Child's Hel Children's Health Awareness Day. And so the end of the month, of course, is Halloween, <laughs> which is a children's day, right? And um, so we thought that this would be a good theme to kind of, uh, to kind of talk about. And uh, part of the reason for that is also that, I don't know if you know this, uh, I, don't, Sarah, I think Sarah knows this because we talked about it on the phone the other day, but Children's Health Awareness Day was established by Calvin Coolidge in 1928, who is from? St. Vermont. Fairfield, Vermont. That's right, from Vermont. And, uh, and the reason why he established the day was because children's health care at the end of like the 19th century was disastrous. It was nothing like we knew it today. And children, sick children were literally being just kind of left. And it was really an awful situation. And he wanted to really raise awareness about this. But the first few hospitals that opened directed to children's health care were not like we would imagine today, like Boston's Children's Hospital. or It was their mission was to provide food, clothing, and shelter mm. to children. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at the heart of that is a concept that today we would call housing as health care, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because they understood that these children needed a home in order to get better and to be well. And so really I'd like that to kind of be our topic for discussion is housing as health care, what does that mean in the, in the lives of children? So uh, we've already talked, Sarah and I uh, have talked a little bit about this concept a bit and how it plays out a little bit. What, what, what do you think about that, Liz? Well, first I want to thank you for the invitation and tell you just um, a little bit about myself. Yeah, please. As a consultant um, that incorporated Common Land Solutions, um, I am not charging. <laughs> this is volunteer time, but I spent 20 years um, in the affordable housing development community, in nonprofits, um, and specifically developing a lot in Franklin County, in mm -hmm. rural Vermont and managed a housing rehab loan program and did some other things that um, were all kind of grounded in uh, way back when I was in university studying actually housing zoning which grew right out of health threats and health conditions. So this is a really nice tie-in and then um, it's nice to have Voices for Vermont Children on the phone because I spent seven years on the school board in Burlington and worked with uh, people who worked for Vermont Voices for Vermont Children. So I appreciate um, participating in this conversation. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack around housing, how the impact of affordable, safe, decent, affordable housing for children, um, especially in their early formative years. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned, like early in the century, 19th century, um, there was a recognition that children were at risk, their health was at risk if they weren't at a minimum fed and sheltered and those were probably you know in the form of orphanages or something like that but that was also the same time our zoning laws came into being and that was because there was um, rampant there were pandemic conditions in overcrowded housing and so people were getting really sick um, so that is also part of the underlying architecture of housing as health care um, Florence Nightingale was a big proponent you know um, and also, I do want to recognize that, you know, we as a society 
were were founded on the enslavement of Africans and we, you know, took land from indigenous, we colonized land from indigenous uh, tribes. And so, you know, automatically we created a, a, a land and a real estate system that put people out uh, and failed to provide, yeah. you know, their basic needs for them. And so, you know, our real estate system itself is just, um, you know, kind of on these pillars of, a caste system that never delivered um, what is needed to have a healthy quality of life, mm. um, and so that's that's you know I just think important to recognize um, and hold ourselves responsible and accountable for that. Um, I could go on and on about housing and healthcare because I spent um, a couple years writing a playbook for how energy and efficiency and weatherization improves indoor air quality and that contributes a lot to minimizing the effects of asthma and for children that is especially um, important and you know leverages huge gains and positive impacts over time mm -hmm. so there's also just the physical um, aspects of developing affordable housing in Vermont um, is accomplished through a framework of funding agencies and technical assistance that d delivers healthy housing, healthy indoor air quality, and you know there are studies across the nation around the health outcomes of children and families who live in housing that's been weatherized and made more energy efficient. So that's another um, dimension of the topic. Mm -hmm. You know what I love is like just in that, uh, just kind of in those few thoughts we touched on like equality, right, you know, racial, uh, racial equality, racial justice, um, like weatherization, climate stuff, health care, right? And I think that all too often, sometimes, I think when we work kind of in the nonprofit field or in some kind of advocacy work, sometimes it's very easy to end up in your silo yeah. and not kind of move out of it. And I think that if there's any issue that we all can come together around, it's housing. And I mean, it crosses all political lines, it crosses all everything. You're not gonna find anybody who says, you know, no, you know, no people should just not have homes. Like, no, no one like, thinks that. Exactly. And so uh, that's why we're really trying to be real intentional about bringing that to light and talking about housing in light of these different themes uh, to kind of, you know, make people comfortable to step out of their silo and talk about how this fits within the bigger system, you know? So I'm so glad that you're, that you're with us today. So glad that you're with us today. Thank you. And Sarah, I just love the name of your organization. That, that in and of itself does it for me. <laughs> Voices for Children, I love it. Why don't you kind of tell, uh, tell the folks who are watching a bit about yourself and your work and, and a bit about Voices for, Voices for Children around for decades, and um, we have always worked holistically across sectors across the whole state to really try to, I really am appreciating these comments because it's so clear that all of the systems are connected and all of them impact each other, and also all parts of children's lives affect the rest of their lives. Um, and housing is an example of that that's just very uh, salient. Um, not only is it incredibly common sense, but it's also really researched and backed by research. Um, in terms of health especially, there is a researcher who's pretty well-known in Vermont. She's become well-known in Vermont, Megan Sandel, um, out of Boston. She's a pediatrician and researcher, and all of her work has basically shown the, the direct connection between housing and health to the degree that she she has a phrase where she says housing is a vaccine. Um, mm. And it's really interesting coming out of, nice. well, hoping to soon come out of this pandemic year and a half, um, when it, it really was immediately obvious to everybody that housing was directly protective of people's health in that moment um, in pandemic conditions. But really, it's, it's that way all the time, and especially for kids. The, you know, the highest rates of homelessness are actually in the youngest children. Um, and not only does it have, like, direct effects on their health, which um, we all can understand and their well-being, 
but it also just has really long-term cumulative potential effects in, on all sorts of things, like their education, um, the, in terms of like ACEs, long-term health impacts way far into adulthood. Um, and those things are hard to calculate, but I think we all know that, that they're there. Um, and I'm also really appreciating your comments, uh, Liz, about the underlying system, because I think many of us who work in various areas are just really ready to think across those silos in a really transformational way, um, recognizing that the system that we have right now doesn't actually at all guarantee housing for children. In fact, um, it works uh, on a principle of scarcity, and the roots are discriminatory of so many things, as we know. Um, and I think it's really a good time to to think about how we can actually make this a guarantee and actually address the correcting for the, um, those oppressive systems. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that we're in, in such a, you know, everyone talks about or, or everyone uses these days the phrase unprecedented. We're living in these unprecedented times in this unprecedented crisis and everything is unprecedented. That's very true. I think part, something else that's unprecedented right now is the attention that affordable housing is getting, you know, at the, the legislative level, certainly in terms of funding, in terms of, I mean, there's sort of all these um, positive dynamics that are coming out of the crisis that we're in that truly is unprecedented. And, um, you know, maybe something also that will come out of that will be unprecedented work to get, you know, even more intentionally, intentionally together. Um, you know, towards towards working towards a solution to this to this whole situation. You know, Sarah, what is the? Um, do you want to say a word about the kind of advocacy kind of stuff that that Voices does? Well, sure. We work um, primarily on on state policy, um, like I said, across all areas, um, economic security and economic justice are a very core principle for us, um, and housing is right in there with that. Um, and we also work, you know, in communities and with communities, uh, various grassroots organizing initiatives as well. Mm -hmm, super. And was there, uh, were you guys involved with the uh, rental, um, rental housing safety bill stuff? Um, not, not as a lead, no. <laughs> sure. No, no, yeah. But uh, yes, we're members of the, the housing, the housing advocacy community, definitely. There's a lot of conversation right now starting to happen about the rental housing safety bills. We move towards another legislative s s uh, session, right? And that the, um, yes, yes. and we know that the bill had been passed by the House and the Senate, and then uh, was vetoed kind of su surprisingly. And, you know, I think that there's, uh, it's important, I think, that we continue the conversation, though, about how that we need a rental housing safety bill. Uh, yeah. You know, and if, if we got to start over, whatever we got to do, but we can't give up, and we got to see the importance behind that piece of legislation. And I think that, um, the tie is so obvious, you know, in with, in with children. I think in particular the two pieces of the, it's interesting when you talk about the bill, it's always interesting to me what people call it. Some people call it like the registry bill, <laughs> some people call it by its, you know, by S79. Um, but like I feel like we have to talk about just a rental housing safety bill because that's what it is. That's what it was and that's what we still need and that's, you know, what's going to, the fight that has to continue or the work yeah. that that needs to continue, yeah. you know? Yeah, on that point, um, actually, you know, rental housing codes were um, an outgrowth of zoning codes. And so, you know, there's a whole body of health and safety codes that go along with housing. And I mean, all of our codes are related to health and safety. So it's interesting that, you know, people are willing to tolerate zoning codes, but then the minute you go to, you know, regulate housing, 
which, and housing is incredibly regulated in many ways people don't realize, mm -hmm. usually to the benefit of the owner. Um, but, you know, when we talk about regulating uh, multifamily building, there's a, you know, strange reaction that is, again, rooted in that concept of ownership and proprietariness that our real estate system is based on because, you know, we don't recognize multifamily property as a business, which it is. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking as a multifamily property owner, it's a business and it should be expected that multifamily property owners who don't live in the building and those who do, you know, have a business that needs to be regulated for health and safety reasons. The re same reason we have liquor control, you know, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. same thing. We want to make sure the public is safe and healthy and we're not putting the public in harm's way. But that's um, not a common way of thinking about multifamily housing. We think of it as like, oh, it's just your other house and you get to control mm -hmm. whatever or not or put people at risk. And I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to educate the public about kind of that fundamental concept that, you know, we also for the first time in Vermont have contractor registration. So there was finally a recognition that contractors um, go into your home and c could cause health and safety problems for you if they're not um, skilled and qualified. And so now we have a registration for contractors requirement and that's you know along the same lines. And we have fire codes and we have mm -hmm. energy efficiency codes when you're building new construction. So um, leaving out the rental housing code is just a huge um, missed opportunity and it actually puts children in particular in harm's way. Vermont has one of the fi highest fire rates in the nation from the old prop from old property that hasn't been reinvested in and hasn't been kept up and it hasn't been maintained. The energy burden is huge mm -hmm. for families which mm -hmm. takes food out of kids mouths mm -hmm. and other you know basic needs aren't met because we have these very old dilapidated buildings where people pay exorbitant amounts for utilities every month. So yeah, there's there's a lot to talk about there. I remember I was, uh, you know, I'm new, I, I'm, so I'm new to Vermont and I came from uh, Rhode Island, the, well, Rhode Island via Connecticut, but really I'm a Rhode Islander uh, by origin. And uh, I worked there in the course of my, uh, in the course of my career, I worked in, well, in the early days of my career, kind of in direct care with, um, with youth, uh, at-risk youth and their families. And, you know, with, uh, we call the DCYF there, not DCF, but DCYF. And uh, I remember kind of upon reflection one day, after I'd been doing this for, I think two years, two or three years at the time, and it just struck me how so many of these families who were just stooped in poverty, and they would get sort of linked up with you know, DCYF involvement because here you had like, they were caught in this, in that, that system that, that's not a liberating system at all, right? And so, and it, it's constant crisis management and, and mom can never, or, or dad or mom and dad can, can't just get ahead, you know? And the primary, you know, they're looking at their kids and thinking like, well, we have to sacrifice for ourselves to we get to put the kids first, but sometimes there's nothing left to sacrifice. And, and it really is because of this, uh, in, I think a large part, because of that system that instead of liberating and empowering and freeing, um, can instead really, really drown the person, you know? And I think that it's sort of a, uh, you know, I have a, uh, I have a friend who, does some uh, Uber Uber driving part time, and it was commenting on how the amount of money that people spend on Uber. Why don't they just get a car? And it's like, well, because that's not the way the system works, <laughs> right? Because the system doesn't allow us to save money. It's the same kind of thing. Or get a loan. Yeah, or get credit. a loan, or like. Credit. So you know, we end up caught in these systems, and I think yeah. to a certain degree, all of us. In, in different ways, in smaller ways for some than others, but that in the in that system, it's the kids who are ultimately always, always the victim and always the one who struggle, and uh, and we got to work together to get 
yeah. to get out of it. And I think also I want to um, just bring up that you know the um, Let's Grow Kids was just able to move forward a significant bill on childcare. And Sarah, you probably know more about this than me, but you know now that they have finally achieved a pretty heavy lift, a big goal. Um, you know, when you think about actually implementing that, and you have families who are constantly moving around and in and out of homelessness, it's like what happens when kids try and go to school. If they try and go to childcare, you're gonna, you know, create a situation where they don't get consistent care. Mm -hmm you know, and you'll see significant um, academic losses and, you know, just brain development losses. And that sets them up for failure. And then we as a society will spend more and more on meeting their needs in a disjointed, fractured way because our systems are not aligned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those, that, that stability that affordable housing brings in addition to having safe, decent, healthy, affordable housing, um, just having the stability of housing allows a family to access subsidized childcare or school mm -hmm. in a more consistent way, which avoids costs for us as a society down the road. But that prevention concept is, uh, I think, still has a, a ramp to go up before people, you know, really support spending now to prevent costs later mm -hmm. um, so maybe the pandemic will you know there's just a, a larger so um, societal kind of psychological shift that would need to happen mm -hmm. in order to really be successful like vermont has universal health care for children and it is possible to calculate all of the savings from that but for whatever reason that has not happened, and it could be demonstrated that the same would, outcome would happen if we had a more affordable housing for everyone, guaranteed. For sure. That's for a great point. It really, we can either protect the investments we're making in all the other systems, which are and should be significant, child care, education, right? Like we really generally commit as a state to like having those systems be strong. Um, and and Dr. Dinosaur, right? So, and healthcare for children. So, we spend a lot of money in those areas, as you're pointing out. If we don't have stable housing, we're actually undermining <laughs> those very investments at the same time as we're making them. Um, it's a co there's a cost shift there to all of these other systems, and it could be calculated. You're right. Like how much, how much of those, how much money would be saved by having stable housing for every family? For sure. We're coming to the end of our of our time together, so I would throw out though one last uh, kind of thought for maybe if we could. I'd love to just get a word from both of you uh, about it. Um, at the end of last summer, at the height of the pandemic, we had two thousand Vermonters living homeless Vermonters living in motels in the through the motel program, four hundred of which were children. We know that this program is getting extended. Some people have to go, but right, the, we all know the we see it in the news. Um, but those numbers strike me: two thousand Vermonters, four hundred children. We need answers because this can't go on forever. But a thought, maybe, from each of you about kind of the part of the what's part of the answer? Well, from the kind of housing development side, like creating housing. Um, I actually opened the first COVID hotel in, in Vermont for CVOEO, for Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, and the transformation, I think, was phenomenal in terms of people just having the, that privacy, a place to go every day, no matter what, even though there was a lot of chaos around. Um, but I do wonder about the opportunity for the medical community and the hospitals and to become more engaged in this conversation and this issue and and that is happening certainly UVM has um, subsidized a motel uh, for Champlain Housing Trust I worked on a project Rutland Housing Authority was able to get a huge gift around 225,000 or more from Rutland Regional Hospital so 
the engagement of hospitals in providing capital because it will bring their costs down, they are beginning to see that and then they are they are seeing those savings and that is more data, more financial data mm -hmm. to demonstrate that that partnership can grow and grow. Mm -hmm. Sarah, one minute. Yeah, I've, I've to offer us a good, a good closing thought. A good closing thought. Um, it's a continuum, right? The unstable housing is a continuum all the way from being unhoused um, to having unaffordable housing where you're vulnerable to sudden economic shock, shocks, shock loss, et cetera. Um, and uh, that's, that's an incomplete, <laughs> incomplete thought. I was just going to say that number of, of unhoused people um, during the pandemic was higher, much higher than that count in previous years, and all of the housing advocates kind of said, oh, I, we, t we told you this was the case, right? Like, there have been all along people who are not being counted. Like, as, a, as a, an example, um, in the 2018-2019 school year, there were 1,000 students that schools counted as qualifying for services for homeless students under the McKinney-Vento Act. Um, some of them are doubled up. Some of them are living in cars. Some of them are in shelters. Um, and some of them are unsheltered. So in any case, there's this whole continuum. Um, but I think what we would like to see is a system where um, there's much more democratic control of housing and where it's permanently affordable and mm -hmm. not then like subject to the market. It's just way too important to be just at the whim of the broader economy or <laughs> it just market cost is what it is. Like it needs to be rooted somewhere else. For sure. Well, on that note, it is a continuum, and so is our work, all of our work together. That I like the picture of a continuum because it keeps rolling, and uh, that's what we're going to do. Keep rolling, keep working together. Thank you both for joining us today, and everyone at home, join us again uh, for our uh, ongoing conversation about housing from a slightly different perspective with each show. And if you have any questions about the work that we do, you can find out everything you want to know and more at vtaffordablehousing.org. And thank you for joining us. And Sarah and Liz, once again, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David.